So today we are going to look into object detection and we have already seen like how we can do classification. So the agenda today will be, we'll see like uh, what uh, actually object detection is. We will go through like a very simple approach uh, which we call sliding window, which we can use to solve this problem. And we will look into like this uh, spatial technique which is called image pyramid. And we have seen this earlier as well when we were doing key point extraction or like the corner detection, we were using these kind of pyramids. So we will look that uh, look into that again today for object detection. And then finally we'll look into like, let's say we have an algorithm which can perform this object detection, how we can evaluate like how good that algorithm is doing. So we'll see like how object detection problem is uh, evaluated. Okay. So object recognition, uh, so you all know uh, by now that given an image, you have to predict like whether a particular object is present in that image or not. So that's called object recognition. We also call that object classification, <clears throat> sorry, object classification. Okay, so for example, if person is one of the classes which you're interested in, then given like the input images, in this case, we have these five sample images, you'll have to make a decision whether person is present in that image or not. So it's just like a simple yes and no answer. And it doesn't matter like how many person there are. For example, in this one, we have two, in this one, we have three. And it doesn't matter like how big or how small it is and where in the image it's located, okay? We just have to predict whether it's there or not. So that's called recognition or classification. Now, object localization, also known as object detection, it's not only saying that the particular object is present in the image or not, you will also have to determine exactly where in the image the person is located, okay? So in this particular case, uh, there's a girl standing here, so we'll have to draw this bounding box around this person. So then what will happen is if we'll have multiple objects or multiple instances of that category, then we'll have to draw multiple boxes in that image. In this case, we have two. So you'll have to predict two bounding boxes. So in this case, we have three. So uh, a perfect algorithm will draw three bounding boxes around these three people here, okay? Same as like with the other cases. Now, most of the time, like what we do is we only draw bo bounding boxes, right? But a perfect solution uh, will have to detect like uh, each pixel in the image, whether it belongs to that particular class or not. So in that case, instead of this bounding box, you will also have to draw this fine boundary around this person. And that's called object segmentation. So there's like this fine dif uh, uh, differ uh, differentiation between like the localization or detection task and segmentation. In segmentation, you have to draw this fine boundary where every pixel in the image will have to say which category or which class this pixel belongs to. Okay, so for detection, we will only draw these bounding boxes. Now, uh, this problem can have like uh, different variations. So the images which I showed you earlier, they were like uh, captured from um, ground view, but you can have captured from aerial view as well, right? So in this particular case, you have this image, maybe captured from a UAV or a helicopter, we don't know. In that case, if you have to perform, let's say human detection or person detection, so you can see that the appearance of that human will be it, it will be very different uh, from like what you have seen from the ground views. So again, I mean, the same problem, there are different variations. Again, I mean, you can have surveillance images, right? So this is like most of the time these CCTV cameras are mounted over buildings. So again, the, there is some elevation in that, uh, in that viewpoint. So the kind of appearance of uh, the same object, uh, people in this case, it will be different from when you're capturing the same object from ground view. So again, this is same like human detection or you can say object detection, but different variations of the same problem.
Now, uh, in real world, what will happen is when you will capture some image, so it will hardly happen that there is just one object category present. Okay, so most of the time you will see that I mean there are multiple categories uh, present in the same image. Now there is a dis distinction between like multiple objects and multiple instances. Now when I, when I'm saying multiple objects, it means that you have different types of objects. So if let's say we have uh, five classes of objects, five different categories, let's say laptop, bottle, this bowl, cup, etc. Okay then you will have uh, different categories of objects. So that's called multiple objects. The other variation is multiple instances. So multiple instances is it's like same uh, object category, but different object instances. Okay, so for example, let's say you have a category bottle. So in this particular image, you can see that you have two bottles. So this is called like multiple instances of a bottle in the same image, okay? And of course, like this is uh, this image, you can see that uh, there are multiple objects present. And so in realistic uh, scenarios, uh, always uh, this is going to happen. So I think there are a couple of questions. Let me go through uh, them. So question from Sammy, we email you the project proposal. Yeah, I think you will have to submit it on web courses and we can discuss this after the class if you want. So there is a question from Mohammed. In the second picture, there are other people present inside of his boundary. So how can it differentiate it? So probably you are talking about this image, right? Yes. So it means like uh, the objects are overlapping. And that's that's perfectly fine. So what will happen is, I mean, this is also a right prediction, but if you extend this bounding box more towards the left, that's also fine. Okay, so this is like, I think a very minor point and what might happen is when you train your network, then you have to provide some kind of ground truth to train it, right? Now, how to get annotation? I mean, we have like human uh, workers, amazing talkers maybe. So you will ask them, okay, these are the images, then draw bounding boxes around like humans. So then of course there will be some kind of human error involved there. So if you, I'm sending this image to like two different uh, amazing talkers to annotate, to get the annotations, then it would happen that one is drawing a bounding box like this, but the other will draw a bounding box, which is slightly towards the left. So that's kind of kind of human error, which will always be there in your uh, data set annotations. And when you're training your network on that kind of annotation, so you will see that variation. Okay, so, and you can also have like some kind of overlap. In this case, I mean, this line would have been crossing uh, the edge of the first person as well. So that will also happen. And in bounding boxes, that will happen. But if you think about if you are doing segmentation, right, in segmentation, that will never happen because it's it's like a 2D image, right, what you are seeing. And if there is an overlap, only one of the object will be, will be present there, right? So in case of semantic segmentation, each pixel will have only one category. But when you're dealing with bounding boxes, they can be overlapping and it happens a lot. I hope that answered your question. And so you're saying like a bag on chair, how would it be differentiated? So yeah, if a bag is lying on a chair, then you will have two bonding boxes, one for chair, one for bag. And it could happen that your uh, bonding box for bag is like completely inside the bonding box for chair. So uh, that's fine, Sunil. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's move forward. Uh, okay, so now the question is why exactly we need uh, this object detection? Because classification is also doing the job, right? It's telling you which objects are present in the image or not. For example, in this case, if I use a classifier, it can tell you like there's a chair, there's a table, there's a laptop, there's a cup, there's a bottle, right? 
So the question is why exactly we need detection. And so the answer is like, when you look from uh, any application point of view, then that's very easy to understand. For example, if we look into self-driving cars, right? So for self-driving car, let's say we are performing some kind of image classification, then what we need is in a self-driving car, the car should know where the road is. It should know if like a person is or a pedestrian is crossing a road. Okay, so if you just perform classification, for example, this is like, let's say image uh, from the front view of a car, then just saying that like two pedestrians are present, it's not going to help you. The car should know where exactly like in the, uh, in the scene of view, those pedestrians are located. So that's why we need detection because the pedestrians might be like in the center of the road, then the car should come to a halt, it should press uh, brakes, right? But if the pedestrians are walking uh, on the side, uh, on the sidewalk, then that's perfectly fine. So this is like one simple example where uh, this object detection uh, is very useful. And th there are many other applications. Okay, so now the question is how, how we can do object detection. And we will go through a very simple solution which makes use of a sliding window approach. And uh, I think you have seen this sliding, uh, sliding window before uh, when we were uh, talking about convolution uh, neural networks. Uh, we have also seen sliding window when we were talking about a uh, histogram of gradients. Okay, so sliding window is given an image. What you do is you take a window of certain aspect ratio of certain shape M cross N, let's say, and you simply slide this window across all the possible position or locations in this input image. Okay, so that's called sliding window and we'll see like exactly how uh, that's, uh, that's done. And this simple approach has been like used in, used in many inferential uh, papers. So for example, we have uh, the space detector paper, uh, Vera Jones in 2001, and it's, it's used a lot. And it has like, I was checking yesterday, it has around 22,000 citations, which is huge. So they also used a sliding window approach. We have this histogram of gradients. We have already seen this paper. We already know how to do this. This paper had around uh, 33,000 citations last week. And we have also like this paper, this deformable part-based models. So this, uh, this was also used for uh, object detection. And they also used uh, this sliding window approach. Okay, so one uh, uh, quick question from Furkan. So he has two questions. For object recognition, is it more easy for algorithm to detect objects if the objects are segmented? So you're talking about three different problems in this one question. So you're talking about recognition, detection, and segmentation. Is it more easy for algorithm to detect objects if the objects are? So when you're saying objects are segmented, you mean like uh, the ground truth? Um, yes, if the ground truths are segmented, is it easy for the algorithm to detect them instead of bound, using bounding boxes? That's my question. Actually. Yeah, I mean, ideally, uh, ideally, it should be easy. But I mean, to be frank, I haven't seen like any study which tries to compare between bounding boxes and uh, these pixel wise segmentations. But ideally, it should be better. So what we have seen is, I mean, not images, but we have tried for videos. And for videos, if we have like those finer boundaries, like pixel wise annotations, as compared to bonding boxes. So the same kind of architecture, if you train on these two different annotations, then the, the network which is trained on uh, the finer boundaries, it, it performs much better than the bonding boxes. But for images, I'm not sure if there is any comparative uh, study or not, but ideally, yes. Okay. okay. So your second question, can we calculate the areas of the segmented areas? Like so, I was I was asking if like, can we calculate, can we calculate the total pixels in that segment area so that we can get the total area? I mean, is there, is there some kind of function of that or just for research purposes asking that question? 
Yeah, so in each pixel, you know uh, whether it belongs to that category or not. You can just count those pixels, right? That will give you the area. So we can do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now let's see like how we can use this uh, sliding window approach using template matching for object detection. So for example, we have, uh, let's say we have this template of a chair. Okay. And this is our testing image. And the problem is we have to locate or we have to detect where the chair is present in this particular image. So what we do is we will take this template and put it like at every possible location in this testing image, starting from this location. Okay, so we start from here. We start like sliding, uh, maybe just uh, skipping one pixel at a time. And then again, we skip like one pixel uh, in the vertical direction and start scanning. So we scan all the locations. And what we can do is we can find like the correlation between uh, this template and uh, the patch which we can extract from uh, this location. So if there is a huge match between the template and that patch, it means we'll get very high correlation and we can say that that object is present in that particular location or not. So for this particular example, if you find the correlation uh, using the sliding window, this is the output. And you can see that it's highly active at this particular location. So this was like uh, when we placed this bonding box over this chair. So we can use like this simple correlation to determine whether this particular template or chair in this case is present in this image or not. Okay. Now the issue with this approach is if we have, let's say a different image such as this, and we want to find out whether we have a chair or not. So again, we will slide like this uh, template uh, all over this image. We'll find the correlation. And for detection, what you will have to do is you'll have to use some kind of threshold on the correlation value. So let's say 0.5. If, you, if it's like greater than 0.5, you say chair is present and you know the location. So based on that kind of thresholding, in this input image, your algorithm will say like, you have this chair present at these locations and which is not true. Okay. So the issue here is what we are doing is when we are comparing this template with the extracted patches, we are comparing like pixel wise for each pixel we are finding the correlation. And uh, that's the issue because chair will have like different shapes. They will have different sizes. They will have different coloring. They might also have different kind of structures. So if you do like comparison for each pixel, it's not going to work. So the only cases where it will work is where you want to find the exact match, which we saw like in the previous image. All right. Now the interesting question is, okay, so we can't do like pixel wise matching. So wh what should be the next step? And so you know that uh, we can try to extract features from this location, right? And instead of comparing like pixel values, we can compare maybe uh, the representation which you get from this extracted patch, right? And then if you have like a patch of a chair, then the latent representation which you will get from all the chairs, patches of chairs, they will be like close to each other. And that's another way you can uh, try to find like the correlation between these patches and these uh, templates. Now let's see like how we can improve this further. So the general approach uh, you already know, you have this image and what you do is you take like uh, a window which will have certain uh, aspect ratio and you're going to slide that like in all, pos uh, all possible uh, locations. And then you're going to extract features uh, from that particular location. Now, instead of using a template, what we can do is you can extract the feature then you know that these features are for any particular uh, class category, right? Then a nice thing you can do is you can try to classify those features. So you can use a classifier, okay? And then we'll see like how we can do some kind of post-processing to further improve it. Okay, so scanning all possible locations, uh, that's pretty simple. You select like uh, some aspect ratio or some 
size for this bonding box slide like for all the locations starting from here all the way until this point right then for each location what you do is you extract this rgb patch okay so yeah before going to the feature extraction let's see like uh, what kind of issues we can have here so one thing is uh this window you have it will have a fixed shape right so if you look at like uh the pedestrians on, on the street so the shape of or uh or like the size of uh, this particular pedestrian here it's much bigger when you compare to like pedestrians on the back they are pretty small right so what will happen is if you will apply this kind of aspect ratio or, diff, uh, or this kind of window on this person then it's it's kind of fitting perfectly but if you put like this uh window over this uh this person over here then it's not covering like the full person i mean there there's a lot of background there so then what will happen is the features which you are going to extract at this location for a person they are going to be way different than the features which are being extracted at this uh, background region okay so let's see how we can fix that so yeah that's the issue you have different sizes here so what we do is this was like a your image at a high resolution you just resize it to a smaller resolution okay and then again slide the window you had over this resized image and you don't resize like once you resize it multiple times so you resize this resize, uh, resize it further okay and you keep shrinking like unless you have like an image where you can fit uh, your your bonding box so this use of multiple scales we have seen this uh, before in the form of octaves if you remember uh, when we're trying to extract sif features and at a high level it's the same concept you want to extract features uh, from the object uh, categories like at different scales okay there we were interested in extracting like the the key points at different scales so this is called like scale space pyramid you have heard this term before and what we are doing here is this is like the original resolution of your input image you keep resizing it to a small resolution okay so in this case we have three four five six uh, different scales this is called image pyramid and let's see like how we can uh, build this kind of pyramid so <clears throat> for this particular image what we are doing is we are scaling it to half every at uh, at, at at every step and what we do is before uh, rescaling we actually perform a gaussian prefiltering and prefiltering is required because when you subsample or resize it to a smaller resolution there are different ways to do that and usually what you do is you skip like uh, alternate pixels now when you're just skipping alternate pixels you might lose some of the values here right some of the features here so to make sure you don't miss anything what you do is you perform some kind of smoothing or filtering where like uh, the pixel value you are generating it's taking into account like all the pixel values in the neighborhood so if you do that then you will make sure that you are not missing any important features in your input image okay so whenever you rescale you perform a filtering um, before that now this is uh, just showing like uh, the same resized uh, resized images but at the same uh, upscaled version. So this is like uh, one eighth of this original image. And this is like after applying the Gaussian filter. So in this image, you can see that uh, you can easily recognize this. It's not uh, very different from your original input image. Okay, so here is another example uh, where you have this uh, zebra. So this was the original image. This is the, uh, reduced version again you're reducing further all the way until you have like uh, two cross two pixels or one cross uh, sorry uh, eight cross eight pixels all right now if you re uh, resize this and try to look at like the same resolutions then we are showing that on on the top here and you can see that here you have like fine details present this is 512 by 512 image and as you 
move along, you can see that the final tails are getting blurred and they're, they're like almost lost in this final image. Now talking about the scale, if you look at like one pixel in this big image, so it's kind of, you can see these stripes here, right? In these, each, each of these pixels. But as you move further down uh, to a lower scale, you can see that in this one, like the single pixel is just representing this whole nose here in the last one. So you can, you can do that comparison. And it means that if you use like a certain window in this high resolution image, and if you use the same bounding box in all of these images, then you are actually extracting features at different scales. So what will happen is you will have lots of lots of uh, training images. Then in all of those images, uh, the, sh the size of your input object will be varying a lot. So if you do this kind of scaling or build this image pyramid, then you're making sure that your network or whatever model you're designing, it has seen that object at different scales. So uh, how we construct this Gaussian pyramid, it's a very simple process. So let's say, uh, let's just consider one dimensional case and you can easily extend that, that to two dimensional case. Okay, so here we are seeing that these are pixel values along the X axis. And these are pixel values for your images. So what you do is you apply your filter mask or your Gaussian. Okay, so let's say in this case, it's a five cross a one kernel. If it's an image, it will be a five cross five kernel. And using all these values, you will get one pixel value. And if you slide that to the left, again, you will get some uh, value here. But for the next scale, what you will do is you will alter alternate your pixels. So you're going to skip like this pixel, this pixel at this location and again this one. Okay, so then this is going to give you like a resolution which is just half of your input image. And you keep repeating this. Okay, so you filter, then you subsample. So this process of where you are missing these intermediate pixels, this is called subsampling and this is used to like lower your resolution. And it's just opposite of interpolation where you try to increase your resolution. So in the next step, you can see that again, you apply the Gaussian filter, you get this value and again, you will skip like pixel values in between. So here you can observe that you are not changing your Gaussian kernel. You are using the same Gaussian kernel to filter different scales but if you look carefully, you will see that in a way, the shape or the size of your kernel is increasing. It's twice as big as the kernel in the first stage. And that is happening because you are skipping pixels in between. So the area which your kernel is seeing at this level, it will be twice as big as the area it was looking at this initial level. Okay, so although you're not changing your kernel, but ideally you are making it like twice as big at each level. Okay, so you repeat that like until you reach like certain level which you have predefined or you reach to like just one pixel or two cross two pixels. So you can predetermine that based on like what you want to uh, do with that. Okay. So Another interesting uh, aspect of this Gaussian pyramid is if you count like the number of pixels or the memory you require to store uh, these subsample images, it will be only four third of the original image. So in terms of memory, it's not taking a lot of um, lot of memory. All right, so that was the issue of different scales, and we can we just saw that we can easily resolve that using multiple scales or image pyramids. Now, what about aspect ratio? So until now we have seen that we are using like the same aspect ratio for each locations, right? But if a person is like, like uh, lying around something like this, then this object detector or this window will never be able to like fit this person, right? So that's an issue and using your normal, this 
sliding window approach this is very hard to hard to address but later we will see like when we look into like more advanced version of object detector detectors using cnns how these kind of uh, issues can be resolved okay so that was just the first step of this sliding window algorithm where we are only trying to scan all possible locations so what we do is we start with the original resolution we scan all the positions all right then we rescale the image we again scan all the possible locations and we do that for all the scales we have in our image pyramid the next step is feature extraction and that's pretty uh, pretty straightforward for all those locations in all those scales you will just extract the features all right and uh, the method you want to use it's up to you and again as like in you saw in template matching you can just extract extract like the pixel values that's perfectly fine you can extract like uh, set features you can extract histogram of gradients so it doesn't matter which features you are using it's uh, the point is like from where and what's the window size which you are using to extract the features so you can you uh, extract hog you can extract sift and you know that how to extract these two set of features so for these two you can just compute the gradients so you don't have to compute gradients for all those patches separately you can pre compute like the gradients for the whole image and then you'll have gradients for those patches as well okay and the second step is like you just do voting uh, of the orientations and you do some kind of normalization and that will give you features for each window so you can perform the uh, edge detection on the full image that's fine and then you extract features from this particular location and we have seen like in the i think last lecture how we can extract either shift or hog features from a window small window you just divide that into multiple uh, blocks and then each block is divided into multiple cells and for each cell you count like uh, what are the orientation of the gradients and then you do voting based on the number of bins you have those are called your orientations right and you do that for all these locations so just just a quick recap of this so you will have this uh, window and you will have these blocks so each block is like of shape 2 cross 2 so you have four cells in each block and you extract like these orientations for each cell and for each block you just can get like the orientations you got from all the four cells and then you can normalize it and you extract those features for one block and you just can get the features from all the blocks you have in one window and that will be your feature set okay and similarly when you can do the same for shift feature features as well now once you have the features then you can easily assign labels to those features right so you will extract like uh, these patches from different scales so when you're extracting the patches then you know that in the ground truth whether a person was present or not so you know that that from the ground truth so whenever you are scanning like a background for example these cases there is no person so you can determine that using your ground truth now what you do is you put all these patches where there are no person you put them as negative examples and all these examples shown here these are your positive cases so it's saying that a person is present person is present and these are like person is not present and then you extract features from this location so for those features you can classify like you can use a uh, svm you can train like a, a linear classifier and you can also train like a neural network so send these features as an input to your neural network and then you can train it based on your positive and negative training examples all right so again so this is just classification which we have already covered so this is a nice way how you can use classification to solve the detection problem now this is a simple linear classifier here so you solve this equation based on your positive samples your negative samples that will give you like some kind of diffusion boundary which you can use during your testing time to determine whether a particular testing sample is person or not and again you'll have to run the classifier uh, at all scales uh, that's fine and then what will happen is you will have to set some threshold to your classifier 
let's say if your classifier is predicting between zero and one, and it could be a binary classifier, you might be predicting just one value, or you could be predicting two different values as we discussed last time. So you'll have to put some threshold there. So it will tell you like whether a person is present or not. Now, what will happen is during test time, let's say you have a test image, you will again, you will again like uh, extract all those uh, patches like you were doing for a training. And then you will pass those patches to a trained classifier. So then your classifier will say whether a person is present or not, present or not. And based on that, you can mark in your input image whether there is a person or not. All right, so this is like a sample example. If this, this was your testing image, then what you will do is uh, you will start from this location. You will, pick, uh, you will put your bonding box here, extract this image, extract the features, pass those features to a trained classifier, the classifier will say whether a person is present or not. So in this case, it said no. So you move on. So you keep sliding, keep sliding. So these are like all the locations where the classifier said like a person is present and that uh, signal was like clearing some kind of threshold. So then you have drawn all those bonding boxes here. You can see here that this is like a, a negative uh, example here, even though there is no person standing, but it, the classifier said there was a person standing, okay? So this is like the initial set of results. And here you can observe that a bunch of bounding boxes are positive. And that's reasonable because it doesn't matter with you if you slide like your window slightly to your left or slightly to your right. Your, if your classifier is robust enough, it will, it will detect like all these bounding boxes as person, right? So in a way, this is not right. Uh, sorry, this is not wrong, but uh, eventually what you'll have to do is you'll have to try to merge all of these bonding boxes into one because there is just one person standing here. Okay, because otherwise it will be very hard to evaluate because in a way your classifier is saying there are like three, four persons standing here, which is not right. And same is true for all of these other detections. Now, so to, to, to address that, what we do is we have some, some kind of post-processing. Okay. And Again, uh, there is a term which you have already seen. Uh, we call that non-maximum suppression. So we'll have multiple detections. Okay, so we can use this non-maximum suppression to actually merge these bonding boxes. Now, this term NMS you have uh, seen when we were doing edge detection, right? So the idea there was you want like only true edges and you don't want like very thick boundaries for edges. And to address that issue, what we did is we tried to use this uh, NMS uh, algorithm where we only pick like the, the pixel as an edge if it's like highly, uh, if it's highly active as compared to the neighborhood. So this was the whole idea. If this is an edge and your algorithm is detecting or your, when you compute the derivative, it's saying like three different points, these are edges. So what you do is in the normal direction, you will see that which of these three is like maximum. So you will compare X, Y with its, uh, with its neighborhood. And if the value here or the activation here, it's greater than this and it's also greater than this, then you will keep this as an edge. But if it's smaller than this, then you will uh, disregard this, right? So this is just a recap, uh, you already know this. And similarly, uh, we use this algorithm for suppressing the false, uh, the false detections or multiple detections for each person. Now, uh, uh, let's see like how we uh, do this. So we iterate like over all the detections we have. All right, so let's say you have thousand detections for one image. You will go through the, uh, all the detections and then you'll have a particular score or a confidence level associated with each of those detections, right? So, and that uh, confidence score is coming from a classifier because your classifier was predicting values between zero and one, right? Then you used some kind of threshold, let's say 0.5, which said that values above 0.5 are like positives, below 0.5 are negatives. Now, between 0.5 and one, there are certain ranges, like right? there will be a lot of values. So based on that score, you will just pick the highest score if it's close, close to one, that will be your most confident prediction. Then what you do is you take that, uh, you take that uh, highly confidence uh, det detection and you find its overlap with all the other boxes. 
So by overlap, I meant like intersection over union. So let's say this was your detection. So let's say you have two detections, then intersection over union is, so this is intersection over union. So intersection on the numerator and union on the denominator. So if you have two detections or two bonding boxes, this blue region here is the intersection, right? It's like how much they are overlapping with each other. And union is like combine both bonding boxes and the area of that. So intersection over union is used like highly used in detection task, whether it's segmentation or whether it's bonding box detection. So then what you do is you find the ratio of these two. Now, if the intersection of union is pretty high, so that's like the maximum value is one, it means that both the boxes are completely overlapping with each other because the area of the intersection will be equal to area of the union, right? In there. But if, the, if it's close to zero, it means that uh, they are not overlapping at all. So zero means less overlap, one means highly overlap. Okay, so we compute this uh, intersection over union now we set a threshold and usually that's 0.5 and what we do is we remove all the boxes which have like very high overlap okay so usually we need a threshold for that we set that 0.5 so if the iou score is greater than 0.5 we remove the bonding box which has like lower confidence score Okay, so that's how like non maximum maximum suppression works here. And again, we repeat the process for all the boxes. We will repeat this uh, step, right? For, for all the remaining boxes. So let's see like how uh, this works. Uh, for example, this blue box here, let's say this has the highest confidence score among all these bonding boxes. Okay, so we'll pick this will compute the intersection over union, which we saw in the last slide with all the other boxes. So for all these boxes, the intersection over union will be zero, right? Because there's no intersection at all. There's no overlap. So you will not, you're not going to remove these boxes, but if you look at these uh, three, four boxes here, there is a high overlap and it's certainly like it's more than 0.5. So all these three boxes will be removed in the first iteration. And that's your first detection, okay? And you're going to repeat that for the other boxes. So now the next step will be what you will do is you will now ignore this box. You will find the box which has the highest confidence among these and you will pick that. For example, if this is the box, then again, you will repeat that process. So then those will be removed and you can see here that these two boxes were not removed. And there is some overlap between these two boxes, but it's not clearing the threshold of 0.5. So after the end of this NMS algorithm, you will get something like this. And these are your positive detections. And you can in a way say that your algorithm detected like person at these, these, these locations. Professor? Yes. Sorry, sorry, we can't, we can't hear you clearly. Yeah. Can you just type, type on the chat box? No, we are not doing any subsampling or high to low resolution. Okay, so let me let me go back. Okay, so subsampling was done at this stage when we were extracting the features what you will do is you will take the original sized image. Okay. You have this bonding box, you slide over all the possible locations and for each location, you will extract the feature. All right. Now you know that what's the ground truth label for that feature. So it will be either person present or person not present. 
and you can easily find that out using the ground truth because you know from the ground truth where exactly the person was present in this image okay so based on that you will have some positive samples and you will have some negative samples now when you're doing this extraction so this feature extraction is done for multiple scales so we'll extract feature from this original image then the subsampled image then the subsampled image right for the full image pyramid and then what will happen is let's say for this original image uh, this is giving you let's say thousand samples if there are thousand possible locations here right thousand samples so then you subsample and let's say that is giving you 500 uh, more locations so your total training sample will be 1500 and if you subsample further it might go to 1800 so that's the training samples and that's it after that you don't do any subsampling is it clear okay so now once you have those all those features and the ground labels you will train your classifier right now when you are doing testing then again you will extract features for all the scales right and then pass all those uh, extracted features to the train classifier and then your classifier will tell you whether an object is present or not so let's say you passed in like this high resolution image the original resolution then the classifier said like a person present here present here present here that's it then you subsample again extracted all the locations and features passed to the classifier it will say in this case here it's a smaller uh, bonding box right compared to this it will say person present it will say person present that's it then you keep resizing so this is the smallest size here right so while testing you'll have to do subsampling and then your classifier will tell you whether the object is present or not probably the order i told you that just reverse that I mean this is like the smallest scale this is like the biggest scale okay so for the high resolution the network will predict this bonding box and for the smallest resolution the network will predict this bonding box okay so i hope that was clear and so after nms uh, this is something which you will get now the question is how you are going to evaluate uh, your algorithm so how do you know that uh, whether it's doing the right thing or not so let's cover this uh, in the next lecture i think uh, we can uh, stop uh, here today so any questions so far So Sunil, did that answer your question? Yeah, Doctor, but the, the, I was having a doubt means uh, when we're doing non-maximal Again, we, we can't hear. I mean, at least I can't hear you. So I think uh, okay. if you write in the chat, that will be best. So in this case, you don't have to do any subsampling because, okay, so let me read it carefully. Are you subsampling here in non-maximal suppression? Because as we have different size boxes over here, how we can do the overlap, the boxes of different size. So, okay, let me go back. Okay, let's consider this image, right? So forget about subsampling and forget about everything we have seen so far. So think about this. You have this image, okay? Just this resolution, nothing else, no subsampling. Now, all you have is the these yellow bonding boxes. Okay, so let's say these are like, uh, how many, 25 bonding boxes, all right? Then for each bonding box, you will have a confidence score 
which says like how confident the classifier is when it predicts that this is a person. So it will be a score between 0.5 to 1, right? Between that range because you use the threshold of 0.5. And from that point onwards, then you'll have to compute the overlap or intersection over union between these bounding boxes. So you don't have to worry about different scales because you can have different size boxes and still you can compute that intersection over union. Okay, great. Okay, so any other question before we end today? Um, I have a question. In terms of, I don't know if it's going to be covered in future lectures, but in terms of like real time object detection, mm -hmm. um, would that be kind of working, doing this whole process continuously as we, as we get the input video, or are there like optimizations that we would go over in the future, to to make sure that we can handle that those all those operations in real time? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very interesting question and. If you do a baseline implementation of the approach which we discussed today, uh, I don't think you can run it in real time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there are like certain optimizations which you can do and they can be like in terms of the image resolution you use and like how many boxes you're extracting like per image. You can slide over like multiple pixels as well. And I think uh, the there are ways like which you can use to make this uh, real time. But if you just use the basic approach we, which we discussed, it won't make it real time. Okay. And we are going to like uh, see some advanced ver uh, version of this, which will be in fact real time. Okay. So just wait for like a couple of next lectures. We are okay. going to cover that. Okay. Sounds good. All right, any other question uh, before we close? I'm just waiting if someone is typing over chat. So if you're typing, just talk now, otherwise we are uh, going to end it here. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone.